Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ivan Yip, and from the Department of Mathematics. And it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our first distinguished speaker of today, Professor Ken Ribbit, a renowned professor of mathematics at UC Berkeley. A prominent alumnus of Brown University and Harvard University, Professor Ribbit earned his PhD in 1973 from Harvard under the supervision of Professor John Tate. Following three years of teaching at Princeton and two years of research in Paris, he joined the Berkeley faculty in 1978. Professor Ribbit has made significant contributions to the fields of number theory and algebraic geometry. He is perhaps best known for his proof of the epsilon conjecture in 1986, now recognized as Ribbit's theorem. His proof was a crucial step towards the proof of Fermat's last theorem, which implies that the theorem would then follow from the modularity conjecture of elliptic curves, also known as the taniyama shimura conjecture. This was finally resolved by Professor Andrew Wiles almost a decade later. Over the years, Professor Ribit has received numerous accolades, including the Fermat Prize in 1989 and an honorary PhD from Brown University in 1998. He was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1997, to the US National Academy of Sciences in 2000, and became a fellow of the American Mathematical Society in 2012. In 2017, he was also awarded the prestigious Brouwer Medal by the Royal Dutch Mathematical Society. And finally, Professor Ribbit served as president of the American Mathematical Society from 2017 to 2019. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Ken Ribbit. Okay, thank, thank you very much for the introduction, and it's, uh, I want to thank everybody for the invitation. It's really a pleasure and an honor for me to speak here and to um, be back in Hong Kong after my first visit, which was exactly 30 years ago, um, in connection with Fermat's Last Theorem. As you'll see, uh, I prepared some slides in advance that might have been com comprehensible even to people who are not mathematicians. So if I look in the audience, I see people who are professional mathematicians and young people who are already mathematicians, but maybe not yet professional. And the thing that's really dramatic is among people with mathematical training, how much more mathematics is part of our lives than when you talk to people who um, have not studied mathematics. And in fact, I did that several times right before coming here because uh, I found out that there is a UC Berkeley alumni group in Hong Kong that I visited on Saturday afternoon. And when I started telling them about Fermat's Last Theorem, they were not at all familiar with the concept of perfect powers, perfect squares, and so on. But the fact that we talk about the positive integers is maybe a shadow of the fact that this whole subject, which is called Diophantine geometry, Diophantine equations, really grew out of classical Greek mathematics, where the integers were really the fundamental objects. If you take the positive integers and you square them, you get numbers like 1, 4, 9, 16, and 25. You can raise them to the third power and the fourth power, and so on. And as you take higher and higher powers, one thing that you see, at least um, in your impression, is that these numbers are getting sparser and sparser. When you take two perfect squares and you add them together, you are uh, not necessarily or even likely going to get a perfect square, but sometimes you do. If you square 5 and 12, you add up the squares, you get 169, which is 13 squared. And for another example, 33 squared plus 56 squared is, again, a perfect square. And the theorem that uh, is called Fermat's last theorem is the statement in red, which says simply that if you take higher powers, instead of taking squares, you take cubes, or fourth powers, or fifth powers, this never happens. So there are two ways to say that. One is to say that if you add two fifth powers, the sum is not a fifth power. Or another way to say the same thing is that if you take a fifth power and you try to separate it out as the sum of two fifth powers, you will not succeed. And both statements are 
part of our lives. In fact, Fermat himself, who was a 17th century jurist and amateur mathematician, wrote Fermat's last theorem as a marginal note in a number theory book that he was reading. And of course, he wrote it in Latin, but if you translate what he said, he said that it's impossible to separate a perfect cube into two other cubes, a fourth power into two other fourth powers, and so on. And in equations, you can just say that if you take x to the n, where x is a perfect nth power, and y to the n, another or the same nth power, you add them together, uh, the result is not a nth power z to the n. And Fermat's equation is usually stated in positive integers, but for reasons that you can explore on your own if you like, um, being positive is not really so much uh, the issue, but rather being non-zero is uh, the thing that, would, uh, that you want to rule out. So that's the statement of Fermat's last theorem. And we never kind of have direct evidence that Fermat stated this uh, theorem in any public way. He wrote it marginally in a book that was found by his son, Samuel de Fermat. Samuel published an edition of the book by Diophantus that his father had been reading and included this marginal note. The actual marginal note and Fermat's copy of the book have gone missing. We haven't seen them. And uh, Fermat left a, a large volume of notes and comments that were interpreted by his successors, mathematicians, who went to establish every one of the assertions that Fermat made with the um, rather uh, unfortunate exception of the statement that became known as Fermat's last theorem. They were unable to establish uh, this statement. And uh, the thing was kind of left as an open problem in mathematics for roughly 350 years. And we believe that Fermat himself realized after writing this marginal note, perhaps years or decades after it, that he did not have a proof of this assertion that he wrote down. He was very interested in the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n. But in detail, he treated that equation only when n is equal to 4. So he proved that the sum of two perfect fourth powers is not, again, a perfect fourth power. In fact, he proved that the sum of two perfect fourth powers is not a perfect square. And uh, if you look then at the progress after Fermat's death, in the following century, in the 18th century, Euler proved the theorem for cubes by a method that was really not part of Fermat's repertoire. It involved taking a cube root of unity, e to the 2 pi i over 3, and working with a number system that is derived from that single number. And after Euler, uh, there are others, including Legendre and Dirichlet, who treated the case n equal 5. And the uh, work continued on and on until uh, the time that I want to describe, which is the time of uh, Andrew Wiles and the work leading up to Andrew Wiles. One thing that I should say, and I think uh, many of you realize, is that if you have a perfect nth power and you have a divisor of n called the divisor d, then already you have a perfect dth power. So for example, if you have a 15th power that is a cube. It's also a 15th power. And once you know that the theorem is true for fourth powers, if you want to prove it true for every nth power, where n is 3, 4, 5, and so on, you realize that it's enough to prove it for pth powers, where p is a prime number other than 2, 3, 5, 7, and so on. And so the equation that people think of when they think of Fermat's equation is x to the p plus y to the p equals z to the p, where p is an odd prime number, 3, 5, 7, and so on. And so uh, in a lot of the equations that I'm going to write down, there's this number p. And that's because of the work that Fermat did in the 17th century 
And the simple observation that if you have an nth power and n can be decomposed in some way, then you also have a power for d, where d is a divisor. And if you look at the history of Fermat's last theorem, I realized this only fairly recently, that there is an American mathematician named Vandiver who was probably the single person who did the deepest work and the most complete work on Fermat's last theorem until 30 years ago. And he was quite renowned when he was an active mathematician. There's a very big prize in number theory of the American Math Society called the Cole Prize. And he received that prize in 1931 for his work on Fermat's last theorem. And he was able to show that the theorem held for all exponents bigger than two up to a number like 2,000. So he's established various criteria for verifying that the theorem is true. And in addition, he actually showed prime by prime that for every prime up to 2,000, at least one of the criteria was satisfied. If I had been speaking about the subject six months ago, I would have told you about a 19th century mathematician named Kummer. And Kummer is uh, credited for doing some really deep work on Fermat's last theorem and basically for uh, launching modern algebraic number theory in his attempt to prove Fermat's last theorem. And there's something that's uh, very important in the subject which is called Kummer's criterion for checking that um, Fermat's last theorem is true for a given exponent. It involves the visibility of Bernoulli numbers by this exponent. But I learned only quite recently that a lot of Kummer's work was not really complete. It was, uh, let's say, flawed. And one of the things that Van Diver did was to examine Kummer's output and to verify carefully the assertions that had been credited to Kummer. So he's kind of like a lost figure in this whole story that I wanted to mention today. Now already in the introduction you heard about Andrew Wiles and I uh, said his name before. This is a photo that I took of Andrew at a math conference uh, in the year 2000. And quite famously in 1993 Wiles, who had been quite secretive about uh, his proof that he had been assembling for Fermat's last theorem, announced at a conference in Cambridge, England, that um, he had a proof of the theorem. And what he did was to give a series of three one-hour lectures and let the suspense sort of build. And by the end of the second lecture, most people were saying to each other, well, there's only one way that um, this series of lectures can end, namely with the statement of Fermat's last theorem. And that's exactly what happened. The date of his third lecture was June 23, 1993, so a little bit more than 30 years ago. And this is an article taken from the front page of the New York Times. It's really quite uh, unusual, uh, maybe unprecedented, and maybe not repeated for a mathematical result to be on the first page of the New York Times. And it's a description of Andrew Wiles' announcement. Somewhere in here, I think you'll find my name. There it is, um, Ken Ribbit. And um, this is in the days before the internet. Um, we had email to communicate, but telephone conversations, landline phones were very, um, very uh, important. I should say to the young people that it was only in 2007 that um, the iPhone was introduced. People didn't have cell phones. And what happened was that the New York Times reporter, Gina, Gina Collada, called the Isaac Newton Institute just as Andrew lect Andrew's lecture was ending. She asked to speak to Andrew, and Andrew turned to me and said, Ken, take the phone call. So uh, it was very loud in the Institute. I literally dove under a desk for some uh, sound isolation, and I spoke to her for about a half hour. And then um, something that's really uh, quite unusual in journalism, she sent me a draft of her article to ask for mathematical corrections, which I supplied. 
Um, reporters don't like to do that with sources. They listen, they um, make notes, and then they write their stories. Um, and it was really kind of an international celebration about the proof of Fermat's last theorem starting June 23rd and in the months that rolled out. Um, at the conference, uh, yeah, so let me go back to this story. Um, there was a Hong Kong conference that was organized almost immediately by a mathematician that many of you know or know of, Xing Tan Yao, who um, said, well, what we have to do is have a conference in Hong Kong as soon as possible where we explain the ingredients of the proof. It was held almost exactly 30 years ago. Uh, in fact, I remember returning to Berkeley on Christmas Day, 1993, and I like to include photos uh, in my slides. So here's a photo where I'm in the center and Yao is to the right. And a Berkeley student who uh, is Chinese and now lives in Beijing uh, wanted to meet Yao. And the three of us had lunch together in the summer of 2019. But this conference was a fantastic success. Um, many, almost all of the people involved in the story came to Hong Kong with the notable exception of Wiles himself. Um, and we gave lectures on, uh, related to the ingredients of the proof and also in our, on our own subsequent work. And uh, there was a book that was published by International Press, which also was founded by S.T. Yao. And it's now in its second edition. It's uh, quite a popular book. And I have uh, just on the slide, uh, the text of the foreword to the book, that explains that it was held um, in, uh, at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and the dates were December 18th through the 21st, so literally, really literally 30 years ago, um, 1993. And uh, you'll see, uh, if, if you examine this carefully, a lot of the names that will uh, come in the story that I want to tell today. So how does the story work? Well, uh, it started with an observation by a mathematician whose name will uh, forever be associated with the story. He's a German mathematician who at the time was working in Saarbrücken. His name is Gerhard Frey. And he was working on ideas connecting elliptic curves, which I will describe in some subsequent slides, and different Diophantine equations. And actually, I think the initial idea of his work was to use the non-existence of solutions to certain Diophantine equations to rule out elliptic curves with various properties. And while he was working, Fry realized that there was algebra going in the two directions, and that if you had an elliptic curve with some uh, strange properties, you would get a solution to Fermat's last theorem and vice versa. That's the thing that really um, struck him. And um, after coming to his uh, enlightened idea, Fry went around and started telling people uh, about his observation, trying to get them to see that there was a connection between Fermat's last theorem and these elliptic curves that I'm going to describe. And I remember Fry coming to Berkeley and taking me aside and telling me about this connection. And actually, I was very skeptical. I didn't think that you could ever prove Fermat's last theorem um, using his construction. And actually, I was completely wrong, OK? Um, and, and I will now try to explain how things unfold. A couple of days ago, I was uh, exploring X, uh, formerly known as Twitter, and I found um, some graphic about um, a, a normal story where you just start and tell the story, and a very convoluted rendition of the same thing, which uh, I will admit that I tend toward, although I hope to make the thing um, as uh, understandable as possible. So I have to start somewhere. And the somewhere is in the subject of elliptic curves. So elliptic curves are uh, given by equations y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, where we can just imagine that a and b are integers. 
And there's a side uh, condition. It's that the discriminant of the cubic polynomial needs to be non-zero, which it normally is. And in fact, um, I remember that my colleague at the time, Hendrik Lenstra, uh, found a method of factoring using elliptic curves. And elliptic curves were completely unknown to the people who were thinking about integer factorization. And they said, well, what's an elliptic curve? And he would say, well, an elliptic curve is just a pair of integers, A and B. That's it. And for uh, an example, I took the integers to be minus 1 and 1. So I have y squared equals x cubed minus x plus 1. And I did something that I hope will be helpful. Namely, I put some dots on integer points, a few integer points, of this particular elliptic curve. And actually, it turns out this elliptic curve has you know, many more integer points than a, a random elliptic curve might have. I think there's a dozen of them, which is quite a lot. And I colored them blue, and one of them is gold. Uh, blue and gold are the colors of the athletic teams of UC Berkeley, the Golden Bears. And um, there is some connection among these different points and the connection is that, uh, as I say on the next slide, if you have two points on the elliptic curve, you can connect them by a line. And this line will intersect the elliptic curve, in general, in a third point. And that third point gives you a way of making a point given two others. And you can parlay that into a group operation on the set of points of an elliptic curve. Now, the one thing is that when you do that, you will introduce denominators. And so when you talk about points of the elliptic curve, you don't want to talk only about points with integer coordinates like 3 and 5, but you want to allow denominators. And as you repeat the process of making new points from old, you will discover that the denominators um, grow very, very fast in a way that you can describe. And there's also the possibility that you might want to take the two points to be the same, in which case you don't connect them up by a chord. Instead, you just make a tangent. So for example, if I took this gold point and I tried to draw a tangent and asked where else it intersects the elliptic curve, it will be the point that's at the bottom whose coordinates are minus 1 and 1. And um, generating new points from old is called the chord and tangent process. And there are lots of theorems about even this, this simple situation. For example, it's a theorem of Mordell from about 100 years ago that if you have an elliptic curve and you look at the set of points with rational coordinates, you can always find a finite set of points such that all the points on the elliptic curve come from that finite set by iterating this chord and tangent process. OK, and here's the same elliptic curve together with a statement that I've already made, which is the fact that uh, when you take two points, you can connect them and you get a third. And in fact, uh, I, sh I said something about a group. What happens is that if you take two points, P and Q, and you connect them and you get a third point, you have to flip that through the x-axis to get the sum of the uh, points. So this blue point at the top would be P plus Q if the two points that you started with were P and Q. And you might ask, what is the zero point of the group? What is the origin of the group? The origin of the group is something called the point at infinity that you get by taking the same equation and looking at it in the projective plane instead of in the affine plane. But the idea um, is mostly taking place on the affine plane that you see on this slide. And what Fry said is the following thing. Suppose you look at Fermat's equation. So you try to think about Fermat's uh, last theorem, x to the p plus y to the p equals z to the p. And you imagine that it's false. So you begin to imagine a proof by contradiction. Well, what would it mean to say that it was false? It would mean that there would be two pth powers whose sum is a pth power. So you have numbers a, b, and c. 
uh, a and B together determine C. It's just that A to the P plus B to the P is a perfect pth power. And Fry said, well, write down this elliptic curve. Y squared equals a cubic, where the roots of the cubic are, two, are 0, A to the P, and minus B to the P. And if you take the discriminant of the cubic, what will happen is that you'll get the differences among the three roots. There are um, three differences. And um, you square what you've gotten because you want to make the signs go away. And the discriminant will be a to the p times b to the p times minus c to the p all squared. And the point is that this is some number raised to the pth power. And Fry had the um, strong sense that this would be uh, something very unusual for an elliptic curve. Um, it's unusual in a number of ways. One is that the discriminant is huge just in size, because p is probably a very, very large prime. And the other is that it's a very round number. It's a perfect pth power, where again, p is a large prime. And there is a statement called the modularity conjecture, which is now a theorem. It was a theorem uh, in starting in the 1990s. And Fry thought that this elliptic curve that he wrote down, which, by the way, is now called a Fry curve, um, would violate the conjecture that all elliptic curves are modular. So he thought that you could prove that this elliptic curve would violate the conjecture. And actually, that's uh, just to jump ahead a little bit. That's the thing that I ended up doing in 1986. And again, the whole point is that the discriminant of the cubic polynomial is abc squared raised to the pth power. It's, it's a perfect pth power, which is a very unusual thing to happen. And uh, let me just be uh, slightly more technical for a moment than uh, in the rest of the lecture. I think that's fine with most people in the audience. There's this whole subject called modular forms. And modular forms are usually given as power series in some variable q. And q is the exponential of some variable in the complex upper half plane, a set of complex numbers with positive imaginary part. That variable is often called tau or z or z. Um, and these modular forms are, are literally holomorphic complex functions. You could say that they live in the world of calculus whereas uh, elliptic curves live in the world of algebra. And the modularity conjecture says that if you have an elliptic curve, like y squared equals x cubed minus x plus 1, there's a modular form that is related to it in some very specific way. And you can verify this conjecture with a computer for any elliptic curve that you write down that has at least you know, modest size coefficients, capital A and capital B. And if you look at y squared equals x cubed minus x plus 1, the modular form is an infinite series, but it starts out um, like uh, q minus 3 q cubed and so on. The uh, even powers of q are missing uh, as it happens in this particular case. And the modularity conjecture says that there is a modular form connected with every elliptic curve y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, where a and b are ordinary integers, and the um, cubic has non-zero discriminant. And uh, let me just say very briefly what that bridge is. So um, when I, again, when I prepared these slides, I didn't know um, whether my audience would know about congruences, which I, I bet you all do. But the point is that if you take an elliptic curve, it's given by some equation. And you can take this equation and view it as a congruence modulo any positive integer that you care to. And the positive integer that we'll take will be a prime number. And the prime number is called L, because there's already a prime number P. And if you ask, you know, how many solutions are there to the congruence y squared equals x cubed minus x plus 1? Well, a, a very coarse upper bound would be L squared, because when you take a congruence mod L, the only numbers are 0 through L minus 1. They're only L numbers, so they're only L possible x's and L possible y's. 
And in fact, if you think about this a little bit more carefully, you could say, well, there are L possible x's. And for every x, you write down x cubed minus x plus 1, which is a number mod L. And you can ask, how many square roots does it have? Well, the answer is at most 2. Um, so there are actually at most 2 times L solutions. And then you can get almost philosophical, and you could say, well, this x cubed minus x plus 1 is kind of some random number mod L. If you take a number mod L, it might be 0, in which case it has only one square root. But um, half the time, when it's non-zero, it'll have two square roots, and half the time, it'll have only one square It'll have no square roots. So on average, you expect a random number mod L has uh, one square root, one square root on average. So you could guess, it's kind of a heuristic argument, to say that the number of solutions to this congruence should be roughly L because um, there are L possible x's. And then for every x on average, as you average over the x's, there should be one square root of x cubed minus x plus 1. Um, and the answer is that uh, the number of solutions is not going to be L on the nose most of the time. But it's a theorem of Helmut Hasse from the 1930s that um, the number of solutions, when you subtract L, you compare it with L, will be within twice the square root of L. So it's kind of a, the difference is some kind of error term. So you could take L minus the number of solutions, or the number of solutions minus L, and call that the error term. It's usually uh, common for cohomological reasons to say that you want to take L minus the number of solutions. And um, what happens here, to make the thing completely concrete, is that this error term if you take, take L to be 7, the error term is minus 4. So that means that L minus the number of solutions is minus 4. And uh, another way of saying that is that there should be 11 solutions. And if you want to make a list of the solutions, you can do that. Um, the most compact way to do it is to look over at the various x's. And for um, those x where there is a square root, you can write down the two square roots, um, giving you two possibilities for y. So for example, if x is 2, x cubed minus x is 6, which is minus 1 mod 7. You add 1, you get 0 mod 7. So x cubed minus x plus 1 is 0, and it has only one square root, 0. But um, if x is 0, for example, then x cubed minus x plus 1 is 1, and there are two square roots, plus 1 and minus 1. And minus 1, of course, is the same as 6. So you can list the solutions and, and kind of verify that the bridge is working in this particular numerical example. But um, of course, if you want to prove it in general, you have to prove it for all elliptic curves and for all values of L. So the thing was called the modularity conjecture. In fact, it had uh, quite a few other names uh, from the time when it was first formulated. When I was a graduate student in the 1970s, people called it Weil's conjecture um, after Andre Weil, Andre Weil, who was a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And there were other names associated with it as it went along, including the name of Yutaka Taniyama, and Goro Shimura. Goro Shimura at the time was a professor at Princeton. And people talk about the Taniyama Shimura conjecture, the Shimura Taniyama conjecture, the Shimura Taniyama Vei conjecture, and so on. And now it's just a theorem. Okay, so we can call it the modularity conjecture. It was proved in a series of articles. Uh, of course, the big article was the contribution of Andrew Wiles. But as I'll describe, there was an accompanying article that really concerned the um, bridge, uh, co-authored with Richard Taylor, who's now a professor at Stanford. And for technical reasons, they couldn't cover all of the elliptic curves, although they got the ones that were associated with Fry's construction. And um, it took until 1999 for the last article to be uh, written. It was called The Modularity of Elliptic Curves Over Q. And then there's a little um, 
secondary title, Wild Threatic Exercises, which I can explain someday. And there are a number of authors, including Broy, Conrad, Diamond, and Taylor. And this was published in 1999. So let's go back to um, Fry's construction, which took place in the early 1980s. And I remember in 1983, 1984, Fry started lecturing publicly at conferences about his idea, hoping that someone would latch onto it and justify this, what you could call his intuition about the subject. Uh, and in Paris, as you may know, there's something called the Seminaire Bourbaki, which uh, takes place three times a year, I think, and each time there are uh, a handful of lectures by different people. And in 1988, there was a lecture by Osterle um, trying to explain um, how uh, Fry's idea had given rise to a number of different approaches that could possibly um, end up proving Fermat's last theorem. Um, one of the approaches that was formulated by Osterle and Spiro, I think, is, is called the ABC conjecture, which is an outstanding conjecture in number theory that would require you know, more than a, a one more lecture, um, lots, lots of digression for the ABC conjecture. And meanwhile, to go back a couple of years, um, Jean-Pierre Serre in Paris worked over Fry's construction and realized that you could um, explain what he was doing in a very short document that um, reduced what he, was, what he needed to uh, what appeared to be a tiny, tiny statement. And this was called conjecture epsilon. Epsilon in calculus is a very small number. Conjecture epsilon was the last little thing you needed to justify Fry's uh, bridge. Um, Fry's connection, it's a different kind of bridge, between the modularity conjecture and Fermat's last theorem. And at the time, there was no archive. It was kind of hard to um, circulate a, um, a manuscript that was not really going to be published as an article. And what Sarah did was to write his thoughts down in a letter that he typed and gave to uh, Jean-Francois Mestre in Paris at the end of the summer of 1985. And what literally happened is that people got copies of this letter from their friends. They would go and photocopy the letter and um, bring it back to their departments and photocopy more copies. And the thing kind of, kind of um, exploded. Uh, it, it went viral. Uh, if you want to use modern terminology, among the community of number theorists um, where um, you really had to prove only something that seemed very, very tiny in order to justify um, what Fry had done. And in fact, what um, Serre wrote in his uh, article is that V plus epsilon would imply Fermat's last theorem. So V uh, is standing for the modularity conjecture. Epsilon was this new thing that uh, Serre formulated. And if you had those two things, you would get Fermat's last theorem. And um, when I saw uh, Serre's letter, I realized that this was a problem that I could really, really focus on because I had done a lot of work um, very close to what was needed to prove conjecture epsilon. And um, somewhat uh, unexpectedly, conjecture epsilon was not proved right away, even though it was a tiny, tiny thing. Many people tried to prove it in, let's say, the academic year, 1985, 1986. And there was no proof until I announced that um, I had established the thing in the summer of 1986. And the proof that I had turned out to be very, very long and very intricate and very complicated. In fact, so much so that I spent the next three years kind of revising my manuscript in order to make it something that people could read and understand. And I wrote an article that was published in a journal called Inventiones Mathematica in 1990, which is four years after 1986. 
And um, I, I personally think that I, I really, um, really um, did a, a pretty good job of trying to explain what I was doing. And I really needed to do that because when I made my announcement, people were so um, surprised by the roundabout nature of the argument that they kind of worried that the thing couldn't possibly be correct. Um, and so once I proved conjecture epsilon, I, we, had a, a module, we had an implication. It used to be, you know, ve plus epsilon implies Fermat, but the implication became ve, namely the modularity conjecture, would imply Fermat's last theorem. And um, Andrew Wiles uh, has explained that he had been captivated by Fermat's last theorem as a young child and was um, motivated to prove the modularity conjecture um, by its connection that had just been established to Fermat's last theorem. And this is very surprising to me, or was, was surprising at the time, certainly, because to me the modularity conjecture was a major, major open problem in arithmetic geometry, and I couldn't imagine that anybody would need extra motivation to prove the modularity conjecture if they thought they had a prayer of doing it. Um, but um, I believe Andrew Wiles, he's kind of explained that he really was motivated by the connection to Fermat. And uh, he, uh, as I wrote at the bottom of the slide, was probably you know, the only mathematician who really thought that he had a, a serious chance of proving the modularity conjecture. Most people in the subject thought the modularity conjecture would end up being true but um, was beyond um, what people could prove in uh, the 1990s. And Wiles um, was a naysayer. Um, and when he uh, was working to prove the modularity conjecture, he was in Princeton. Uh, there are, there's a BBC video, there are lots of books about this that kind of um, give the idea that Wiles would work every night alone in the attic that he had in his house um, in Princeton. Um, he worked alone, didn't tell anyone but his wife what he was working on. And when he finally believed that he had um, something close to a proof, he confided in two of his colleagues at Princeton, Peter Sarnak and Nick Katz. Um, he gave a, a course in Princeton, a graduate course with an especially obscure title um, that Katz and Sarnak attended, and after three or four lectures, all the graduate students gave up. They thought there was kind of no interest whatsoever in the subject. And for most of the spring of 1993, Wiles and Sarnak and Katz would be alone in a seminar room in Fine Hall in Princeton, listening to the ingredients in Wiles's proof. And after his uh, lecture, in the Newton Institute in June 1993, Wiles had this very, very thick manuscript that had all of the ideas that he had been exposing in his graduate course in Princeton. He threw it on a table and he said, I'm submitting it to the Inventiones, uh, the same journal that I talked about before, um, but I don't want people to really see this, so just um, send it to a very small number of referees, uh, chapter by chapter, and, and let's see if the referees agree that I have a solid proof. And um, here for amusement is just the um, uh, schedule of the conference at the Newton Institute. And one of the wild things that happened was that after Andrew gave his lecture where he announced the um, proof, I had to give the following lecture. Um, <laughs> and th there was a coffee break of a half hour between when I was speaking to um, Gina Collada of the New York Times. But the coffee break, as you'll see from a photo that I hope to be able to show, um, actually was champagne. It was Napa Valley sparkling wine that everybody drank. So I came in and I gave a lecture um, at 11 o'clock, 11.30, uh, and it's probably the drunkest audience that I've ever had, <laughs> and possibly the, the drunkest lecturer that they ever had. Um, and I, I certainly um, don't remember exactly um, what I said. So here is a photo taken that day after Andrew's announcement. Um, Andrew's advisor, PhD advisor, John Coates is on the left. Andrew is uh, holding the glass of sparkling wine. 
uh, I'm the guy with the mustache, um, three in the um, photo. And to my left, on the right in the photo, is Carl Rubin. Um, and um, that was a long time ago. And I, I do want to project very quickly um, a statement that occurs in a book. And the book is uh, the Abel Prize book. Andrew Wiles won the Abel Prize sometime between 2013 and 2017. I forget which year. And if you get a copy of this book, which is available free online, um, not only is there, um, are there long descriptions of the work of the laureates, um, but there are also autobiographies written by some of the laureates. The description of Wiles's work was written by Chris Skinner of Princeton. It's incredibly detailed and really insightful. It explains all the different things that Wiles did in all the articles that he wrote through 2017 or 18 when this book was published. And the autobiography of Wiles explains that uh, he wasn't quite the recluse in the attic that people say um, in popular accounts. And he gives some description of his family life. And um, uh, having small children was a perfect balance to working on the problem because both required 100% of one's attention. Well, that's it. Um, and now I, I don't have too much time left. I, I want to show you some photos of people. This is Nick Katz, whom I've mentioned a couple of times. And there was a big hiccup in the whole process, which is that about uh, two or three weeks after Katz got his uh, part of the manuscript that he had to read very carefully, he found something that he didn't understand. And he would send email to Andrew Wiles every time there was something that he didn't understand, Wiles would write back immediately. And um, there was one question that Nick had where he didn't get an answer <laughs> right away. And it turned out that Nick had actually found a gap in the proof. And um, this gap, um, at first people thought, well, you just patch it over. It shouldn't be a big deal. But it, it didn't really get fixed um, for 15 months. And um, during that time, people didn't know whether or not this proof was going to hold up. And it got fixed by a joint paper that I've already mentioned uh, by Richard Taylor and Andrew Wiles. And um, here's a photo of Richard Taylor. Richard is now a professor at Stanford University. And uh, the title of the article, um, like most of the titles in the series of articles I'm describing, had, had you know, little <laughs> inclination in the title that they had anything to do with Fermat's last theorem. Um, my article was about Galois representations and modular forms. Um, in the introduction, there's Fermat's equation, but it's really about Galois representations and modular forms. And Andrew's article, which for strange reasons got published in another journal, not in the Invenzione, in the Annals of Mathematics, um, also has um, Fermat's equation in the introduction and also in the title, I guess. But most of the article is about Galois representations in modular forms. And the um, article that plugged everything up was about ring theoretic properties of certain Hecke algebras. And this turned out, among the three articles that I just mentioned, the article that kind of launched a thousand ships. If you ask, you know, what happened in the subject, um, and the subject is these bridges between algebra and analysis, what happened in that subject is that the Taylor-Wiles method um, kind of liberated a whole subject and launched many, many um, connections between algebra and analysis that no one thought might have been possible before 1993 or 1994. Um, today, uh, at least if you're in Hong Kong, today is Barry Mazur's birthday. Um, Barry was born on December 19th, 86 years ago. It's not quite his birthday yet, where he lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. But I wanted to include a photo of Barry because <laughs> probably most of the ingredients in the proof that um, occur in our articles were created by Barry Mazur. And in particular, there's this whole subject of deformations of Galois representations that Barry pioneered um, and that turned out to be crucial 
in the articles by Wiles and Taylor Wiles. So if we just want to summarize logically what this proof is, you start with um, a purported solution to Fermat's equation that you want to rule out. Um, you consider the Fry curve, y squared equals x times x minus a to the p times x plus b to the p. Um, for technical reasons, as Sarah explained in this paper, you might want to permute a and b and c, which you can do as you change signs if you need to, um, for certain congruences to be satisfied. But after you do that, you work with this curve. And what you want to do is you want to get a contradiction by showing the curve is both modular and not modular. <laughs> That's what you have to do. And um, what happened historically is that I proved that it's not modular. I did this around 1986. And then Wiles and Taylor Wiles proved that it is modular. And they did this around 1993 and 1994. So the two papers of Wiles and Taylor Wiles were kind of re-released together in the fall of 1994. And um, the structure of the proof is just what I said. Namely, um, you work independently almost to show that this elliptic curve has two incompatible properties. That gives you the contradiction. The contradiction was predicated on the existence of the solution a to the p plus b to the p equals c to the p. And so you conclude that there can be no further, no possible solutions. And now, um, once I say all of that, which is just kind of the introduction to my lecture, but there's only like eight minutes left, um, I can ask, you know, where, where do I go from here in terms of exposition? There are lots of questions that one can explore. And um, I'll just say that uh, in the last 30 years, I've given lectures on Fermat's last theorem quite a few times, although I try to do it at most once a year now because um, you know, I kind of got talked out. And in different lectures, I go in different directions. And um, one thing that you might ask is, you know, what, what has happened in the last 30 years? That's, that's a kind of um, very, good, uh, very good question. And um, I will say a few things about that in the next several minutes. But I also want to encourage people who haven't already done this to read about Fermat's last theorem um, online and in books and uh, technical articles, whatever level you prefer. So one thing that's happening now, which is a really amazing development in mathematics, is that um, there are a number of people who are trying to formalize different parts of mathematics um, using a computer language called Lean. And one of the leaders of this project is Kevin Buzzard, who's a mathematician at Imperial College London. Actually, just incidentally, he, he was a PhD student of Richard Taylor. He was trained in modular forms. And he's been working to um, kind of convert lots of, uh, to express lots of uh, fundamental tools of mathematics in this computer language lean. And the way he does that is he goes into a room and he recruits like 100 undergraduates who kind of work on um, doing um, certain parts of mathematics and lean. And they've had amazing successes formalizing checking proofs of um, various conjectures. Um, as you know, the subject that I'm talking about, even though I try to talk about it in relatively um, non-technical terms, is a very technical subject. And it's been a dream of Buzzard for, let's say, the last five or 10 years to take the proof of Fermat's last theorem and to decompose it so carefully that you can check it by a computer. And um, he applied for a grant from the British government to do that. And he got the money. And um, what this means is that he's not going to have to teach for the next five years. And uh, he will be supported in, in many ways. And what they want to do is formalize much of the mathematics involved in a modern proof of Fermat's last theorem. I'm just reading from the screen. And um, what you have to do is you have to teach Lean a, a lot of the um, modern structures of mathematics. 
Um, for example, you may have heard of perfectoid spaces that were invented by Peter Schulze. Well, Lee knows about perfectoid spaces. It knows um, what a scheme is in algebraic geometry. And you have to teach it about Galois groups and modular forms and everything else. So, that, so that's one thing that's going on. And another thing that uh, did go on, I'm going back a few years, is that uh, Serre, um, after his uh, letter that he wrote to Mestre, um, wrote a much more detailed manuscript explaining connections between Galois representations and modular forms. And he published this in an article in the Duke Journal in 1987. So there's this thing called Serre's conjecture. And Serre's conjecture, just the, the statement of the conjecture immediately implies Fermat's last theorem. And there has been uh, a lot of work since 1987 trying to prove that conjecture and also to generalize it for um, other spheres, other um, worlds, not just the, the world of classical modular forms. And um, what happened in the early 2000s is that Serre's conjecture, as formulated in 1987, was actually proved by um, Chandra Shekhar Kare, who's the mathematician on the left, and Jean-Pierre Vintonberger, who's the mathematician on the right, who uh, passed away um, a few years ago, unfortunately. And what they did is they proved this conjecture by kind of loading up everything that they knew. And their argument is very, very detailed and intricate. And there are lots of kind of tricks going into it. And they plug in everything that had been established up through 2008 in the general direction of the work of uh, Taylor and Wiles. And in particular, I want to mention a mathematician at the University of Chicago who's Mark Kiesen. Sorry, he's at Harvard now. Um, and uh, Kiesen's work um, proves many, many uh, strengthenings and generalizations of the theorems in um, Wiles and especially Taylor Wiles. And using a lot of the tools of Kiesen uh, was absolutely necessary to Carré and Vanton Berger. And uh, now I came to the end of my lecture because I thought I'd be more or less at the end of my hour, which in fact I am, which is very good. So, okay, thank you for listening. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. So now let's uh, welcome a few questions from the audience. So anyone has a question you want to ask? You can just raise your hand. So I'm sure you've heard of uh, Mashizuki's uh, claim proof of the ABC conjecture, right? Uh, is there anybody here from Kyoto? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I, I actually asked June uh, yesterday or the day before about Mashizuki. Um, and it, it, it's a very unusual situation where the theorem seems to be true in Kyoto, but not in the complement. <laughs> so, um, you know, my, my own. Um, opinion, but it, it's not a very informed opinion, it, it's that Machizuki does not have a proof. But it, it's certainly a, a very unusual situation in mathematics. Usually someone who says, well, I, I've proved a theorem, you know, you can explain uh, very broadly what the structure of the proof is, and then interested people can learn more and more deeply different parts of the proof and kind of all hangs together and makes sense. And in the case of Machizuki, it's almost like the, the proof is you have to redo all of mathematics and you, you kind of do it in a way um, with a different attitude. And as you do that, you learn more than you did when you had the former bad attitude. Um, and uh, he put manuscripts on the, on the web um, soon after announcing his proof. And you know, lots of people tried to read these manuscripts. I tried to start you know, the universal Teichmuller theory and stuff. And, uh, it, it didn't make any sense to me, right? Um, so I stopped. Uh, but I did want to ask, like, assuming if it, it was true, uh, would it be possible to, uh, for him to claim that he then also had a alternate proof for FLT? So uh, the ABC conjecture um, 
it depends how it's formulated. Um, and one formulation would lead to a proof of Fermat's last theorem for sufficiently large exponents. And then the question is, could you make the sufficiently large explicit? So that's kind of a, always a question in mathematics. Like you prove there's only finitely many, um, finitely many exceptions. Um, can, do you know where to stop? Um, so for example, it would be extremely uncomfortable if you had a proof of Fermat's last theorem for sufficiently large exponents, p, but you couldn't say explicitly how large you had to go. Um, and I, one thing that I usually say when I lecture is that you know, people went well, well beyond Vandiver by the early 1990s. And, and so uh, using computers and different criteria, people verified Fermat's last theorem for primes well over a million, maybe up to three million or something like that. So you know, like if Machizuki's uh, proof worked only for primes bigger than, you know, um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, or something, that's a prime. Um, <laughs> you know, pe people would then be motivated to kind of fill in the gaps. Um, ma maybe an, an analogy is like there's something called a tertiary Goldbach conjecture, where you want to prove that odd numbers are sums of three primes. Okay, and the way you prove this, um, Harold Helfgott is the principal prover, is that you prove that it's true using analytic number theory for primes bigger than some huge number, um, for numbers bigger than some huge number, and then you fill in all the rest by explicit computer calculations. So, so, so that could have happened. But it's all conjecture, because we don't, we don't know if the thing works at all, and maybe think it doesn't. All right, any other questions? Maybe we can have time for one more question, I guess. Okay, uh, hello, Professor. Uh, I'd like to ask, like, uh, so you mentioned, uh, you mentioned that Kevin Buzzard is currently uh, doing, uh, trying to decompose from that last theorem with, uh, with a programming language, is that correct? Yes, I think that's what uh, I said. Yes, so I'd like to ask, like, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, computer-aided proof writing? So do you think that um, perhaps um, more, uh, like, uh, perhaps, like, uh, previous constructions and proof techniques can be reduced to uh, lang programming languages and mathematicians in the future. What, what, what would it imply for mathematicians uh, in the future? Well, I, I can't give you a, a very informed answer, that's for sure. Um, but, you, you know, like a, a current topic is, will artificial intelligence really change the way we do mathematics? Um, there's an article that just came out in Nature by a group of people, including Jordan Ellenberg, who's a mathematician at uh, the University of Wisconsin, and I think DeepMind is one of the authors also, talking about artificial intelligence and mathematics, which is just, you know, what is it going to do for us? Well, we don't really know, right? Like some people think it's going to put us out of business because it'll, it'll do proofs better than any human being. Um, but uh, th this is not um, what Ellenberg, for example, thinks. Um, an another kind of topic is suppose you have a proof of some theorem, like the four color theorem, when it was originally proved, where the proof uses um, computers to check a finite number of cases, but um, no human being can actually replicate the proof because there's just too many cases to consider. So then you have to worry well, you know, maybe there was a programming error, um, or maybe there was a hardware error. So in the case of the four color theorem, they had different teams of programmers and different platforms and always getting the same answer. So that's reassuring, but it's not like a proof in, in, in mathematics. Um, uh, okay, so looking forward, do you think that uh, perhaps like uh, routine techniques and proofs can be um, kind of uh, formalized quickly and perhaps mathematicians in the future will have more time to come up with um, newer and more um, special proof techniques that could perhaps like 
um, aid in the help in proving more conjectures, perhaps. Yeah. So I mean, you know, the, the ideal situation is that the computer is there to help us, and you know, it, it, it kind of does work for us. That we kind of reduces drudgery. It's like you know, we don't have to wash the dishes, so we have more time to to play piano after dinner. Um, and, <laughs> You know, but it, it will certainly change the way people work. Um, you know, like when, when I was a, a young mathematician, um, when I did calculations, I literally did them with pen and paper. And um, if I had some statement, I didn't know whether or not it was true or false, I would think about it. You know, how can I make a counterexample? Can I check one or two special cases? And now people say, well, you know, let's run the first 100,000 cases and see what the pattern is. And, Sometimes you're convinced that it's going to be true, and that really um, empowers you to find a, a proof. Or sometimes you'll find a counterexample, or sometimes you'll find new phenomena that you didn't suspect. So um, it, just having a, a new tool will, will change life in an unpredictable way. Yes, I see. Thank you. All right, so since we're out of time, so let's thank our speaker again.